Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Disassociation Nation, live on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. I'm your host, Niz, here with my co-host, PGC, Mr. Paul Gordon Collier. And we're joined this evening by our guest from Liberate Richmond, Virginia, Mr. Cal Molinay. Yeah! Build up for you. You like that? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly! Today is the first, the twenty second of January, two thousand sixteen. I almost said the first of January. Oh my god, that would, that would be weird. Number to call here in FPRN is, as always, two one eight eight nine five thirty eight eighteen. That's two one eight. 895-3818. I got a little excited and said it a little fast the first time. Or you can reach us live on Skype at any point during the show. Feel free to hit us up at FPRN Radio Live. If you've got something for the show, you can shoot us an email. That address is niz, N-I-Z, at disassociationnation.com. So, Paul, what about that Bipcot organ, uh, license that we have? It's a, it, we, we are covered by a Bipcot no-gov license. That is a... Something to be found at uh, bipcot.org. That means that you are free to use this broadcast any way that you like, unless, of course, you're with the government. And by the way, that sound in the background is my dog licking water. <laughs> you're all welcome for that. And I also, real quick, I just want to add here, Niz, I apologize to everyone. I did have my shirt off earlier. It's on now. I'm sorry I disappointed everyone. Paul broke the I internet. <laughs> Again, the picks, internet. picks or I didn't have Again. <laughs> Dude, I did it. That <laughs> probably was a violation of the nap, and I apologize for that. <laughs> yeah, you, you're. It was violence to my eyes. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, did you get to see the speech Trump gave at Liberty University? Because, good lord, I'll tell you. If you missed it, here was one of the best moments of the entire event, Mr. Producer. If you could clip one, please. And they say he's plain spoken. My education is too good to be called plain spoken. I'm not that plain spoken. You know, I wrote The Art of the Deal. I wrote many bestsellers like The Art of the Deal. Everybody read The Art. Who, who has read The Art of the Deal in this room? Everybody. I always say, I always say, a deep, deep second to the Bible. The Bible is the best. The Bible. So, so he, everybody has read it. Who here has read it? Three people clap. Second only to the Bible. Because... <laughs> Four people read it. <laughs> Good God. Man. Oh, man. That's awesome. Even the, even the audience laughed. But I can't, I can't even believe the balls on this guy. I isn't mean, the, second uh, one. Isn't the second one supposed to be uh, Atlas Shrugged? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. No, the so, wall by Bastia. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, this guy really, he does, he fancies himself a messiah. That's, that's the honest truth there. I mean, that's, that's some balls. Which brings me around to this rise in support for authoritarianism that's spreading across the political spectrum. I mean, on the right, you know, you have the jingoism and xenophobia of Donald Trump. Uh, producer, if you could please clip two. But with Ford, you take a look. Now, they call them, Ford moves in. They call Trump. Okay, now it's President Trump. Okay, President Trump. So... <laughs> So they call President Trump and they say, Mr. President, I mean, you have to do this. Ford has been great and wonderful. Say, so what are they building in Mexico for? What do we want to building in Mexico? They're going to build, remember this, cars, trucks, and parts. They're going to sell them across the border. No tax. So you say, we're all smart people. How does that help us? We close plants and we open new plants in Mexico and they sell and there's no tax. So they're going to say, no, 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 we're going forward. I'll say, here's the story. If you go forward, that's fine. But for every car, truck, and whatever else you're building, you are going to pay a 35% tax every time it crosses the border. We have to, or we're not gonna have a country left. Everyone's ripping us. Everyone's ripping us. Now, I don't wanna do that because I'm a free trader. I want free trade. I will tell you, I'm a good Christian. Okay, remember that. And I told you about Christmas, and I guarantee if I become president, we're going to be saying Merry Christmas at every store. We're not going to be doing every store. Every store. The happy holiday, you can leave that over in the corner. Happy holiday, everybody. Here's my tough question. In tough times, 
republics turn to tough men. It's happened throughout history. Caesar, Napoleon, the last century had a lot of republics fail, and I don't have to invoke Goodwin's law and, and go that far, but are you tickling that temptation in democracies that they go for tough guys in tough times? And it's just called the authoritarian temptation. Is that what's playing for Trump? Well, I think we've had very weak people. I think we have very weak people even running. I, I look at some of the people that are running, and I think they're not strong people. And they're good people. I'm not saying they're not good people. I think, But I, I think it is time to have tough, smart people. If you look at China, if you look at some of these countries that are just eating our lunch, they have tough, smart people. It's time that we have tough, smart people. So, so Trump says... He's not for free. He's for free trade, but he, but what he said is not for free trade at all. Uh, I was uh, for free trade before I was against it. That's right. Um, jingoism. I mean, and and his xenophobia. I mean, he wants to build the wall. Muslims are bad. Mexicans are bad. Everybody's bad. Uh, then you have the le- on the left. You have the you know the anti-capitalist, the social totalitarianism, and cultural Marxism of Bernie Sanders. Uh, not to mention, uh, you know, his his uh, absurd, asinine economic uh, ideas. Of econ- or his lack of understanding of economics. Uh, Mr. Producer, clip three, please. Did the individual citizens ever have the right to initiate physical force against other individual citizens? I would expect that would be against the law. People do not have the right to go around beating up. That would be people. wrong, right? That would okay. be wrong. So if they never had that right, could they have delegated it to the government? I guess they have. They have delegated the right of governments to make war. They have delegated the right of governments to build roads. They have delegated all types of rights to people. And in a civilized society, as you know, we have laws, we have judges, we have courts, we have appeal processes. And when people break the law, they are punished. Can you delegate a right that you don't have? I believe the American people have the right in a representative democracy to delegate power to their elected officials to do best for cities, states, and the federal government. So I guess the answer is yes. But didn't you say before okay, that they didn't interested. have the right to do that? Okay. I better get going. Thank you very much. Can I ask real quick, who asked that question? Uh, that was uh, Jan Helfield. Wow, awesome. I don't know who that person is, but I would have parted with about that. that. That was about seven... That's about seven years ago that that interview. That was awesome. awesome. And uh, I I poo poo on Mr. Sanders' answer to that question. Can, can you can uh, you can you do that again? I will, sir. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the fact remains that in either case, it's authoritarianism, and it's so far from what we true what 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 what's truly, really American. I mean, if there ever even was such a thing as you know, being American, where has the rebellious defiance gone? It's, it's now do what I want or else. So with all these people involved in waving flags and shouting about freedom and, and liberty, but freedom and liberty for who and under what pretense? I mean, is it, you know, do as you're told that you conform or else you're undeserving of participation in the illusion of pseudo liberty? I mean, I, I, I look at this political climate and, I, and I'm torn. I'm torn because on one hand, I feel like this is a very dangerous time for liberty, for real liberty, because I, don't, I mean, we have so many people that are blindly goose stepping uh, to the drumbeat of this newfound love for authoritarianism. But then again, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm torn because on the other hand, it's not all gloom and doom as, you know, many, many more people, I, I think, than ever before are starting to wake up to the idea of true liberty. There are, there are millions billions of disenfranchised people all over the world. It's not just here in the United States. And these people are starting to realize that if you're looking to government to be some kind of benevolent overseer of individual liberty, as that South Park meme says, you're going to have a bad time. So there is light in all this darkness, but is it enough? And, you know, I don't know. That That's that's why I'm torn. You know, I... I I don't know that it is enough. I mean, I guess my answer, my answer personally would be, it would probably depend on what they asked me that question in the first place. So, uh, so Cal and Paul, I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts on, on, on this gloom and doom or, or a beacon of hope? 
I mean, is this rise in nationalism and flag waving? It's merging with this general desire for authoritarian obey, obey or else regime at the helm. Uh, is it a disaster waiting to happen, or am I missing something that other libertarians and ANCAPers have picked up on? Because all of a sudden, I'm I'm starting to see ANCAPers who I would have never expected to support any candidate at all coming out in support of this authoritarian Trump. And on the flip side, I have I see libertarians coming out in support of a socialist, uh, Uncle Colonel Sanders. I mean, what the fuck is going on here? How can an anarchist rectify support for an authoritarian? And then in the same sense, how the hell does a libertarian find intellectual consistency in supporting a senile economic illiterate? How does this happen? I think that uh, they have adopted the George Bush foreign, foreign uh, relations strategy, preemptive strikes. Uh, they are I've, I've, actually when we get to the D block, we're going to be talking about people who are now shifting gears and turning against the idea, Im immigration in general. And, and uh, the reasoning is there is a fundamental threat to our well-being, to our liberty. So we're not violating the NAP by using government to try to preemptively stop people from crushing us. That's what I see emerging, Cal. Yeah, I, right? uh, I, see, I, right? nothing, I see nothing but uh, status and denial uh, all over again. Uh, this is, uh, I've seen it often with uh, anarcho-communists. I'm seeing it now with a lot of uh, self-proclaimed anarchists. And, you know, this is uh, nothing new. It's kind of what happens and follows when people are desperate and when people can, uh, are socially inept, when they feel they can't champion their own cause to their neighbors and their friends and their community, uh, well, what else can you do? If you're already given up in your community, then you advocate for politics. So this is your general case of your politics over principles uh, in which people start compromising, compromising their integrity and their values and the very principles that they started off this journey to begin with, um, out of loneliness, despair, uh, apathy, and uh, just to continue to propagate the lie that politics will set you free. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to go into uh, D block. I guess that that'll be like the final segment, I guess, or area in which we go into. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we've got some juiciness there. But I I, I do want to let everybody know that this is uh, not a random cow. You are not a random <laughs> cow, right? Well, I did. This is I actually, did say. We I didn't, did say. Did that. we introduce cow? I don't I, think I we did, introduced I, cow. I did say. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Random Cow. <laughs> I did say in the appears. intro that it was Cal Moline from did you? Liberate Richmond, Virginia. Oh, okay, well, yes, okay, I Mr. Did. Producer Man, he played me. He played me. He was saying in the in the gotcha. chat. You I was know, just checking to see if you were paying attention, there and you go. weren't. I, I wasn't. I wasn't. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's see what Mitt Romney has to say. Oh, let's I love Mitt, Mitt Romney's Romney voice. has to say about yeah. this. Why don't we go to the mall? Didn't you want some new shoes? <laughs> so and then we can be statist. He wants. He thinks mall? he wants some new shoes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I just I, I see all of this. Um, you know, wide. Uh, how did I phrase it before? The rise of widespread authoritarianism, and and I see it from places where I never would have expected it from i mean it's 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 everywhere uh i i was just on uh, i was on facebook the other day and uh i i had seen a post from someone that, that they were talking about banning banning the burqa and i know this is like a hot topic a hot button subject here with a lot of people because uh a lot of people are on this you know the, the moose all the all the muslims are bad we got to get all the muslims out of this round them up and put them in concentrate stamp I mean, numbers on their foreheads they, they say muslims that's what they do well the yeah but the yeah but the the flag wavers say Muslims. No, they like say Muslims. like M O O S E. Yeah, M O S L I M S, Muslims. M O O S E, like a moose. Like oh, I didn't see it that way. Yeah. I saw M O S. I didn't see. Uh, it any, anyway, I mean, I, I'm seeing all this this stuff here. You, you, we saw in the clip there with Trump, you know, saying, "When I'm president, every store is going to say Merry Christmas," and all the people are clapping. Yeah, yes. make them say it. Yes. Freedom, yes. force them to do it. And I'm like, wait, yeah, you wait know a what? Minute. I was, uh, uh, I forget who I was talking to. I was talking to my friend Dimitri. And what, what we were saying was what, what's really, what I see going on, because among conservatives, I see, you know, I, I still have tons of conservative friends, and I try to communicate with them and, and nudge them ever so gently. But I've seen conservative friends that I have known for years that have been stalwart and consistent and demonstrated conservative values for what it's worth now coming out and supporting Trump. 
And, and what I've come to, the conclusion is this. Deep down, people are really afraid of the government gun. And they would rather be on the pointing end of the gun rather than the pointed at end. Well, of it's the always, it's always better to be... On. It's always better to be the shooter. Yes, ah, the shoot. <laughs> that's why the you know the the, the quote unquote Christians. I'm not going to say whether they're Christian or not, but I would have some questions for them. Are cheering when Trump is saying he's basically what he's basically saying to me. What I hear is I'm going to use the government gun to make sure that people say Merry Christ Day. Hold on, Donald. You may want to read the Bible again. It's not in there. <laughs> Doesn't happen like that. It's kind of you're doing it wrong. I'm right. just saying. I, I, I want to go into uh, really quickly. I guess you're, I mean you're mentioning is like is there a rise rise of nationalism and authoritarianism, uh, pretending to Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, and I'll I'll say no. It's it's always been that way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nationalism and authoritarianism goes hand in hand uh, with the he culture hegemony way of how you can control uh, livestock under the state. Uh, you do it first by uh, through Stockholm Syndrome, right? You do it first by encouraging families to, to beat their children, to respect authority, right? Those are the first government in which they, they are encounter. Uh, the condition. people in their lives yeah. who hide behind titles when you ask them, but why, but why, but why? And then, of course, instead of uh, responding, why are trying to say, I don't know, let's find out. So. Uh, they said, because I said so, because I'm your father, because I'm your mother, because of this title. So you raise a generation of uh, children propaganda to just respect title instead of merit, instead of things that you've, you've built up on your own worth instead of have arbitrary titles. So yeah, nationalism, authoritarianism goes hand in hand. That's how you don't need to have uh, you know, a, a police extortionist for every tax slave. You, you control them through the ideology alone. And you do that through school and you do that to a lot of places. You do it through the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Well, I, have an, I, have an, I have an anecdote I wanna share. I think it's really important to what Cal just said. I have started doing this peaceful parenting thing. I'm now about three or four weeks, just three or four weeks into doing this. And I've been wanting to homeschool my daughter. And my daughter has just rebelled, like doesn't want to do homeschooling. Just three to four weeks of this, well, really, we're, almost, we're about a month into this peaceful parenting where I'm asking myself a question, am I using a, an appeal to authority rather than an appeal to reason? Am I treating, I mean, am I giving my daughter a chance to discover for herself why she shouldn't do something? And it's only been about a month now. And all of a sudden, I see changes in her in just a month in how she is looking at school. And now she comes to me and she says, Daddy, I want to be homeschooled. Hmm. This is a pretty big shift. And I think a lot of it has to do with suddenly she's being treated in a different way. She's being treated like a human being who has the right to self-discovery, if you will. And we are conditioned. We are conditioned to want the brute, the big man. We are conditioned. I don't think it's human nature. I think it's our conditioning that we want the big man with the big clipboard that says you go there. When the big man with the big clipboard doesn't show up with the badge, we get nervous. We sit around like lemmings wondering, what do we do with all these chairs? How do we set them up? We can't think for ourselves. They need the big band with the clipboard. It's, it's, it's the clipboard doctrine is what it is. I just yeah. made that up, by the way. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that government uh, heavily uh, encourages. Right? That's the first government they won't need to indoctrinate you against uh, creating that uh, the cycle of violence continues through to child and child. You know, there are now just tall children raising smaller children out there in the world. Uh, in that regard, I like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you see a lot of this uh, goes in hands with sport games, with, with the military. Uh, so pretty much, government just are just trying to say that we're your family, and abusers are your family. Again, it's just part of that Stockholm syndrome thing in which nationalism uh, can arise from. Uh, so you have, I believe, more than a dozen states here in the United Tax Farms of America, for example, that allow public officials to assault children. So and when you want to look for evidence and where, where the state uh, encourages this, you know, you just look no more than your local indoctrination camps. You have a place mm -hmm. in Canada, for example, they passed a law a long while ago that spanking between consensual adults uh, is illegal. They consider that uh, assault. However, they also have a law that permits 
uh, school officials again uh, within a, a reasonable uh, parameter to assault <laughs> children through spanking. So spanking they, between... They do that, they do that here in, in Texas. In, in, in Texas uh, is one I'm, of them, Where we're at here, absolutely. Texas is one of the states that they can spank your children. I mean, I, I believe it's with your consent. I mean, I would never give my consent for anyone to do that, but... Uh, oh, with your child consent, ever gives can. consent to to any of that stuff. That's that's yeah. Totally <laughs> it's consent. Uh, but Cal, Cal, going back to that, going back to that, uh, what you said uh, a few minutes ago about uh, you know that, that had, you don't really see that it's a rise that uh, it, that, that nationalism and, uh, and authoritarianism have always been there. I, I I'm not going to disagree with that. But what I what I will say is that I think that it's starting to take um, a, a a bizarre and dangerous turn. I mean, if you even if you went back, you know, uh, say six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, um, you know, and 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 you had this um, uh, main, this quote unquote mainstream figure that that was on uh, on television in, in a major political race, uh, come out and say, you know, that uh, they're in favor of a uh, a registry for particular members of a religious or a religious group uh, that that they were for uh, forced deportations uh that they were you know i i don't think that it would have the same acceptance that it has today i mean yeah you would still have you know small pockets of people that that were saying yeah right on i'm i'm with that guy but i think the majority of people that would definitely uh that would they, they would find that appalling and you're just not really seeing that today it, it's it's flipped those small pockets are the people that are saying wait a minute this guy's batshit crazy <laughs> And and the large majority now are, are the ones that are waving, yeah, right on, waving their flags, clapping, woo, yeah, force I them. Think, I think it has to do with politeness and comfort. When we were when we felt like we were more secure, we could allow a little bit more liberty for others. But what we had, and to, to Cal's point, I think to your point, Cal, is this is who we have been conditioned to be. We are nationalists. We are statists. We are, you know hit them with the heavy foot and use the big badge to do it. But when times are good and you're not crowding in on my space so much and I'm not worried so much about my food and my resources, I show a little bit more tolerance for you. I hide my nationalism even from myself. But now everything's ramped up. All of a sudden we feel, rightly or wrongly, we, I'm using in the general sense of we, we feel like we're being existentially threatened. And now it's like your true self. I mean, how many times have you had friends in your life that were nice, polite, the best people in the world, and the minute that something goes wrong and it's like just a few of you are going to, quote, unquote, make it, all of a sudden this person turns vicious. The vicious person is who they always were. This is who we always were. Right. Na nationalism works great when you have uh, scapegoats, and uh, government always has had their scapegoat. Uh, you always want to target a, uh, an alternative um, group, subculture group. You know? So when I look back in terms of uh, in the past, what do you have in the past several decades of that targeted uh, manifestation of nationalism in terms of uh, hurting people, uh, discriminating, you'll find people who enjoy vices, right? the war on people, the war on drugs. Uh, you know, so there's a subculture group of naturalism that has existed before, but this is uh, behind the curtain. This is stuff that you've kind of grown up used to, you know, so you don't see it as them being as uh, crucified and uh, in terms of uh, what's going on today and, and the attention to uh, Islam. Right here in the United States, <laughs> without the import of that stuff, you have a crucifixion of, of uh, a vast amount of millions and millions and millions of people suffering, suffering <coughs> in these rape cages for victimless crimes. But that's easy to throw under the carpet because we've been conditioned through this culture hegemony to kind of accept that, right? In the past history, you've had the Irish who've always, always been targeted. Uh, probably in, over a decade ago, uh, you, you've had Wiccans uh, who were targeted in the military and outside of. You had a senator who was calling um, for the abolition to, to get rid of uh, Wiccans in the United States, seeing that they were the scores of society, that these people are the source of all this recklessness going on in the youth because they do not acknowledge their Christian Abrahamic God. So you've always going to find within any kind of political sense, you're going to try to find your scapegoats. Today's scapegoat is this happens to be uh, Islam right now. Uh, you know, it, just like in Germany, trying to trying to find their own scapegoat, their own rice stack I, I would, or, I, or to Jews. I wouldn't say Islam is the only scapegoat. And, I'm not saying the only. Each, yeah, no one's saying only. I mean, because so, each camp for progressives, Christians are the scapegoat. Conservatives are the scapegoat. For conservatives, atheists are the scapegoat. Uh, uh, progressives are the scapegoat. We got a whole bunch of folks scape 
Go there's a there's a good folks. <laughs> there's a good comment here in the uh, in the chat room uh, from Shane, uh, one of our uh, uh, co-hosts on, on our, our sister attack, show, which yep, is our sister show, show Liberty You've Under been Attack. On that show, Cal. Uh, he said that you know th there may even be a little bit of a Hegelian dialectic at work too. Uh, oh, yeah. The mainstream is fearful of Muslims, Mexicans, global warming, etc. It could explain the outright advocacy of fascism, socialism, and the left-right paradigm there. Well, I think, I think there's a Hegelian dialect that even in how, uh, quote-unquote, uh, establishment conservatives are attacking Trump. They sound like they're attacking Trump, but I don't think they are. I think they're playing right into Trump's hands. The way that they're attacking Trump is the stupidest way. If you want to go after Trump, do not galvanize his audience even more to feel like it's, it's him and them against the world. And the way they attack him, that's what they're doing. That, to me, is classic Hegelian dialectic that they're applying. They're really for Trump. That's my supposition. And, and, well, here's another area to kind of substantiate that authoritarianism and nationalism have always gone in a hand. You know, there's an area of, uh, that's been monopolized here in the United States that's always uh, enforced this, and that would be uh, the area of authoritarianism and you find in your courtrooms, right? What's the first thing you have to do when you step inside a courtroom when the uh, stranger in a black dress uh, enters? You must stand up. You must show uh, submission. Mm -hmm. You must uh, respect your place between, before his, unless you be oh, fined, yeah, uh, yeah. contempt of court, and spend a night in a cage, right? So that, right. that stuff has been going on for, for forever since the foundation of, of this uh, the government uh, organization. Well, before of this government, they inherited that, right. Right, so, so here, yeah, so you want to find authoritarianism, and that's, that's where it is. It goes hand in hand with this. Uh, and of course, in beating down children while they're growing up is it, a whole big part of that. Uh, you know, if you if you did if you raise your children with respect, if you raise them with dignity, that that you would grant yourself that all the people would want to uh, extend to you as well. You know, they would they will always question, always question anyone and everyone, regardless of their titles. They won't become these obedient uh, people who, who can't make their own choices unless there's someone who with a title who's walking in front of them. Uh, so just so just to wrap this, as we're coming down here toward towards the end of the block, I think we have probably about a uh, minute and a half, maybe two minutes left. Um, so. You're, are, are, are you uh, gloom and doom, or uh, I mean, is this a, a, it's a distraction? Of hope? I mean, uh, it's, it's a distraction. It's, a it's always it's always been gloom and doom. I mean, people have been talking about the end of the world and forever. You know, you have that in your religions. You have that. Uh, you've had uh, uh, Doug Casey advocating the the end of the economic collapse since uh, in the 1980s. You've, you've had a lot of people talking about this for quite a long, long time. And you have your preppers. It's just this something that comes uh, culturally. It's in our I guess in our myths that you know mm -hmm. inevitably this sort of things kind of happens, and people are always looking at the next event to be. To be it, right? You have your Y2K, you've had your uh, mad cow disease. You always have these kind of scare tactics. And other, of course, who do you go to in protection of these scare tactics? Tactics, the government, right? I, uh, who, who I, do I actually have some hope, and I believe that there is something going on. If you study uh, the end of World War One, what really became clear to everyone was just how brutal and murderous government was, and how much government really didn't care about you. It was it was awful. This this is why the Rus R Russian Revolution happened. There were many other revolutions throughout Europe, and unfortunately, what happened was right as these nations were coming to a stalemate where they were killing each other to no end, America comes in en masse, rescues France and England, and puts Germany under the stocks, gives everyone the illusion that they actually fought for a purpose. America saved government because it was about ready to come undone in Europe until America arrived. And what's happening now in America, there is a significant number of people. I'm not talking about the nationalists. I'm not talking about the Trumpers. I, I'm, I'm hearing more and more people that are questioning, what the hell do we even have government for? What, 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 what are we even doing at this point? I'm hearing more and more folks talk like that. So I think oh. there is something at work here. That's All right. Well, that's well. That's thanks for that, Paul. Uh, that was actually a very good, very good point. Um, and so we ended that block on a, on a good note. Uh, the music is in. Yay, heading into the good note. <laughs> heading into the first break. Uh, stick around. When we get back, we'll have more. Welcome out. back. You have entered the B block. This is Paul Gordon Collier coming at you live from Disassociation Nation with our special host. Mr. Niz, and yeah. just so nobody gets too concerned, Cal Molino was on the last block, <laughs> but Cal Moline 
is with us today. Dude. Cal, what Come on. did you think of <laughs> Cal Molino on the A block? He sounded just like you. Yeah, so that's, where my do- that, that's what my doppelganger's been up to. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine was, what I could do with 10 cows. That was, that was weird. So, 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 Niz, could you give them the specifics for the specifics of the show that you have memorized? <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, man. You know, the, the numbers and the emails. Oh, yeah, man. absolutely. I don't know I about bothered with little people stuff. Come on. I don't know about memorized, but I have them written down, if that's what you mean. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you'd if you like to give us a call, if you have a question for myself, for Paul, or for Cal, uh, you can feel free to give us a call, 218-895-3818, or you can hit us up on Skype, FPRN Radio Live, if you're watching the live feed. Those are down in the bottom left corner of the screen. Uh, if you've got something for the show, maybe a video clip or uh, an idea of something you'd like maybe for us to talk about or a guest you'd like to for us to try to get on, you can shoot us an email. That address is niz at disassociationnation.com. That was beautiful. I don't think anyone can deliver that like you can. <laughs> that, was, that, was <laughs> that was buttery smooth. So, so in all seriousness, I really love what you're doing, Cal, uh, down there in Richmond. And I've been trying to watch. I haven't watched enough of them yet, but I've watched a couple of your couch bit videos. Oh, thank you. They're very entertaining. Uh, but what what Cal is doing, or the way that I'm reading this, Cal, is what you are actually doing is you're actually going out, engaging people, finding the folks that think like you, connecting with them, and galvanizing them to real action. And what I really find fascinating about you that you know, I won't say that I'm an expert in what everybody is doing in and Kapistan, but I haven't heard a whole lot of people who are so locally focused like you are. This to me is kind of different, and I love that. It's almost like you've you've you're basically committed. We're going to take rich. We're going to make Richmond great again. Except <laughs> not the way that Trump <laughs> make Richmond great again, and we lost Niz, but that's okay. That's okay. No. It, yeah. uh, uh, are you back, Mr. Niz? I'm here. I didn't go anywhere. Oh, you didn't go anywhere? Just your picture no. went out? Because yep. when I don't see your picture, I get all lonely. It's like, yeah, I don't get nervous. You know that clipboard thing I talked to you about? You're like my clipboard with the bag. <laughs> see, as long as I see that clipboard, I'm like, it's okay, man. We respect can go. Respect my authority. Give me a respect my authority. I wonder if I should talk to you like Cartman. I can't. I don't think I could pull that off. I'd get throat cancer trying to do that for the whole show. I have a good so video. I actually uh, have some, I I have say, some probing. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I have a good video of me talking at, at a Comic Con. I've seen it. It's, it's in our. You <laughs> used it in we, your that's intro. Right, that's right. Dude, yeah. we used that. We totally used it. You, you were Rick, you were Rick Sanchez. I mean, but, what about your roads, man? Right, what that's the only time he slipped up. That was the only time he went out of character. It just happened. He worked for the roads, and then he's like, "All right, your argument's it, correct." And then it's like, "Okay, so uh, you work for the government or private? Oh, private, private. So the, the government pays a private company <laughs> to build the roads. Well, that's interesting." So I actually have some deep probing questions. First off, we're going to start with your 1997 tax return. There we no, go. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't CNN. You're okay. So. Uh, I wrote these down because I didn't memorize them because I'm not Niz. What gave you the inspiration to start building a network of volunteerist, voluntarists I'm sorry, in Richmond? Uh, it was something I was always uh, going to do. Um, I've always uh, rebuilt against uh, authority figures, uh, people who can bully you around because of titles. Uh, I didn't particularly grow up with, uh, with parents who, I, I guess, through the formative years of my life. So um, until later I reconnected with them, I was kind of too late, right? right? So for them, there were strangers, you know, telling me, I'm your father. It's like, okay, I, I have no idea what you look like for, for a long time. I say, like, okay, well, it's kind of too late now to bring in with that the authoritativeness of, um, of command uh, if you don't grow up with that. So it was, uh, I was, have a friend who said I was fortunate enough not to be uh, raised by that. So uh, for the most part, what uh, politics, uh, a lot of this stuff has kind of taught me growing up is just uh, the world is just full of liars and cowards. And just uh, figuring, well, that being the case, I'll just uh, strike out on my own for until the end. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think my, my first group I was a uh, part of uh, in high school, uh, these things kind of coming back in, just a lot of the injustice was uh, putting together a... Uh, 
uh, Justice for All uh, club and um, at my high school and uh, forming like justice symbols and things like that just to kind of go against a lot of the types of um, yeah injustice that you find around back then my mind so, just- so you made your high school great again yeah, <laughs> make my eyes feel great again. Good, good. So, so a lot of this stuff over the years then was just uh, just checking out organizations after that and finding the one that made me thinking that I could fit in, that I could uh, help advance, but not really ever settling on anyone because uh, the inconsistencies I found there, uh, the lack of their measure of success, uh, the ways that they self cannibalize each other in there, and uh, the lack of uh, the con- principles is, is kind of what led a lot of them to eat each other alive and uh, lead down a p- path that uh, was never a place I wanted to be in. Uh, I find like the greatest crime I could ever commit is to be a hypocrite. And so finding a lot of that stuff in these organizations just uh, eventually Occupy was the last one, was there for a week and I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. <laughs> That's good. And then spent the next uh, year and a half uh, putting together the ideas for uh, for Liberate RVA and just taking everything that I've seen in a lot of organizations where they failed, uh, especially in the uh, ANCOM organizations, because the ANCOM organization, or we, the groups were the ones I felt most identifying with uh, for a long time. Uh, and they're against the state, great. They're against the police state, awesome. Uh, except they're against capitalism, and it's like, ah, that doesn't really drive well with me. And so, um, eventually seeing the same kind of uh, areas in which other organizations have failed, I saw a lot in them as well. And so that's kind of where Liberty RBA started from, to eventually market out uh, commies uh, and to create an organization that uh, will never compromise principles for politics, and which is what you find all over the place, uh, everywhere. So in a so way, it's kind you of know creating the- a circle in which I could vet friends, uh, new friends finally, that I've met here in Richmond, and that we agree in defining our principles and and what we consider wrong and immoral, and uh, now friends that I can trust. You know, these people will never backstab me. You know, politics leads to a lot of uh, area in which you can kind of take definitions and squeak them to mean something else, and then you allow exceptions to a lot of violence, right? Uh, so creating a community with this kind of consistency in which we respect uh, private property of each other is a, a great foundation. My, my vetting circle increases, and I've, I've never been uh, in a position to be hurt by my friends or be, uh, I guess, troubled uh, in, in that regard or do, do you know the principle uh, I don't know if you call it a principle a standard uh, I call it an ideal uh, unity and diversity unity and diversity is and, and this is where I think most organizations have their problems I, I, every single organization that I've ever looked at they always have this problem either on one hand they do not have clearly defined unity and so their diversity pretty much creates the cannibalism that you're talking about and and actually the diversity you start to create all these little mini unities within what was supposed to be one unity because they don't have that clearly defined standard of unity and on the other hand you have organizations that they begin to more tightly define unity until they chase everybody out how do you balance that within your group? Uh, so the foundation of this group, uh, it's something, so words are very important, especially in terms of uh, concretely yeah. spelling them out instead of being vague and leaving it out for anyone to corrupt them. And the, uh, there's been a lot of ideas in the past in which uh, people have bastardized because uh, and their explanation was not very carefully crafted. For example, you can take like minor threat, uh, Ian McKay's straight edge movement. Uh, that he coined the term in which you know life is uh, always trying to you know take away from you. Uh, the the water is uh, toxic, you know the air is polluted, uh, the food is uh, has a lot of uh, poisons in there as well, and so you want to live in this road and trying to make your way through it without uh, all the different areas and sorry the about the dog <laughs> trying to take you down. So he likes to, uh, what you're saying. To keep, That's keep, what it is. Keep yourself together, and so his thing was against. Um, promiscuity yeah. was against uh, alcohol, drug use, uh, you know, so you don't live through your life using crutches. But then, of course, he didn't particularly say, uh, also, don't eat too much food. And so, for example, you have a lot of obese straight edges out there as well, you know, so that con- inconsistency of that, you know, balance your virtues and your vices, I think is where a lot of these messages are trying to go and people can take them and mean other areas into the extreme in which then you have straight edge movements just beating down people who, who smoked cigarettes, who appreciate their vices. So that kind of fanaticism uh, can go from any good idea and become bastardized later. And so taken from a lot of the failures, a lot of the or- other movements and organizations are started off with the easy principle one, starting off with, with anarchy. 
uh, to be against political rulers, be, to be against slave masters, uh, people who uh, arbitrarily decide to want to violently force their opinions onto, 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 onto everyone else, onto members of their own community. So it's not just against the political rulers on that level then. Uh, you universalize it to also include the violence against the state, the violence against what we do to each other, and most importantly, the violence that's done to children. Right, spanking them teaches them that violence is a way to solve problems in this world. Right, practice peaceful parenting. Yeah, let, let me let me interrupt you tires. for a second because I have a number of questions. So I, if I can get more concise answers for you from you, uh, do you have like a basic set of standards that you can communicate with someone? Now I understand that you're going to have a basic set of standards, and that the devil is in the details, so to speak. And as folks become uh, more familiar with the group, you're going to learn that you, you can't overwhelm people with all your stuff all at once. I'm assuming that you would know that. What when when you introduce someone to your group and you say, "Okay, these are our standard. This this is a basic outline of our standards." Do you have something like that that you present and say, "This is the basic agreement," and then we'll we'll walk you through the nuances of of exactly what that means. Do you have that basic? You know, I could put this on my wall as my starting point of understanding of the, the unity of your group. Uh, yeah, you, you'll find that also we have a petition on the website. Uh, the unity would be to not participate, well, I guess to, to be against uh, slave masters, right? This is uh, an anarchist organization. Uh, this is an anarchist tribe. We're the first organization in the world to campaign against the state, to take a position against all slave masters and would-be slave masters, all those who vie for that throne of tyranny, and to support peaceful parenting. Uh, this was established back in May 2012, so the standards have been the same ever since. The principles have remained the same ever since, to always advocate uh, against those who seek the, the throne of tyranny, and that would be a standard, that would be a principle, right? We're a non-political right. organization. Uh, anarchy means without <laughs> political rulers. It doesn't mean sometimes right. without political rulers, or maybe if I run to be your slave master, or maybe it's my friend who's your political who wants to be a political ruler. It means against <coughs> all political rulers, against all. It doesn't mean without. It doesn't mean without agreed upon leaders. Uh, right. I mean, that's yeah, that's so. In the context, rules. for example, right. you have monarchy one mono, archy right ruler. So uh, one political ruler. Anarchy and means without. Archy means ruler. So in this context, without political rulers. Uh, without politicians, without strangers in your life, uh, dictating uh, to violating your consent, because that's how they initiate violence and force their opinions onto everyone in that geographic region, right? So violence will be defined as placing a person in an involuntary position without their consent of choice, i.e. rape, murder, theft, and assault, all violations of self-ownership. And so... Right. Go ahead. No, I was saying... Oh, yeah, right so, 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 so from like, there, we, we can draw uh, Sorry, the universal that. principles. Uh, which that implies. That means then self-ownership. This is a community that respects then private property and self-ownership. All the areas in which the government completely disrespects and, and, and thrives on disrespecting and, and hurting people over for. Uh, so if we're going to draw ourselves a distinction from the state, we have to be an organization that advocates then for consent, whereas government advocates for coercion. So creating that uh, an organization that is not parallel that sometimes is political because then you're no different than any other political gang party out there. Then you're no different than uh, the ANCOMs who lambast the police state, but right. it's okay when the police state enforces their minimum wage uh, slave rules, right? So the lack of consistency even in ANCOMs uh, throws them into a, a problem of hypocrisy there. Uh, an area in which uh, they're just continuing the fraud and to believe in the politics was set you free, that voting was set you free, that government will ever set you free. And so from that position, our, our first principles, yes, is to take that, uh, that courageous principle, uh, position to, to be a champion of liberty uh, and to never uh, beg for, for something that was yours to begin with. Right? You, you were born free right. and then you were turned into a slave by, by strangers. These people don't have that power over you. They're, they're strangers that you've never met in your life. Don't grant them any more legitimacy in, in that area in that regards. Um, so anarchy, in, in that respect, that's where what, what we push forth. Uh, against political rulers, not just in government, but those you find in your interpersonal relationships, and most <clears throat> apparently those involved in the child-parent relationship. And that would be the first one, first number one uh, principle to, to advocate. And from there, uh, anything can go, right? After that, as long as it's voluntary and consensual, the, the diversity so, of backgrounds and experiences can be welcome, and we can go places from there, right? How, how many folks are in your community now? Uh, we have over 100 Let's now. See. And of, of the folks that are, are in your community, you got about 100, over 100, how many would you say are regularly active 
And I'll let you determine what you call regularly active, whether it's they show up at least once a month and go to a meeting or whatever your determination of active is. My determination of active is that they're just talking about it, right? Uh, so if, if they are, uh, they come across a lot, a lot of this problems in their own life and they take uh, the position uh, when they can to advocate against statism where they find it, where they see it uh, in their own interpersonal relationships and having this, these kinds of uh, conversations uh, with one another. And that's pretty much what this organization is founded on, on, uh, you know, to, to have these conversations. You know, the only thing the government can stop us is just right now just talking to so, one another. Uh, so, so, just, so how many of the, of the hundred would you say are regularly them. engaged all in that all oh, them. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the monthly gatherings, that's why they're monthly. You know, people can make them all the time. And so we have different events for, uh, to kind of accommodate uh, different people's needs in that regard. But the one, the one thing you have to do is just talk about it. And that's it. That is that's our activism right there. Uh, it's spreading this idea is to persuade people to take the moral <clears throat> position that they already uh, find in their own life to be against people who how, how, violate. How, how long have you been at this level where you're at, got about a hundred folks? Uh, I think we've been at the level or, now for over a year. Um, probably have to do. Have another. you found what are what are some of the areas where? Because I know when folks come together, they're going to start to realize, hey, you know, there's this uh, area over here that has a need. How do we fill this need? Like, listen, you, you, you start to find numbers in your group that, you know, I really want to speak to this certain type of person. And they're having a real hard time. And you hear it enough, you're like, hey, let's do, do you guys get together and say, you recognize a problem within your community, and do you come together and, and try to find a way to help one another solve that problem? Like, how do you reach your, your, your Vietnam vet grandpa or dad or whatever, whatever the case might be? Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, problems, like what, what, what kind of problem? I mean, helping the uh, Vietnam vet with, with what in particular? Well, it would be, you know, you, you, and it would be, you know, if you had a number of folks that there's somebody that they're trying to reach and they have the same type of argument, the same type of resistance, and you all say, hey, hey, I know, I know how to deal. I know, I know how to try to talk to them. I know how you might be able to open doors. Do you well, have yeah, that type yeah, I mean, of... That, that's, that's, uh... What, that's a great part of uh, the community. We all come from different backgrounds and different uh, from places, uh, and, and coming to the realization that the state has always been our enemy. And yeah, we, we, a lot of people come from military backgrounds, from uh, Jewish backgrounds, Christian backgrounds, uh, from from all over the place. And that's uh, that's great. Uh, I would imagine uh, those people would have a lot more better connection and and a way to 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 bring this uh, conversation to this to those people. Uh, and I think that's uh, the, the great part of uh, the diverse uh, amount of people in our organization, in our community. How do you, or, or let me ask this in a different way. What are some of the ways, the unexpected ways that you found that you guys have come to rely on each other? Maybe that you didn't plan that suddenly emerged. Like if you're drunk and you need a ride home, are these the dudes you call first? Or if you're car has a flat tire are these the dudes or gals that you that you call first as that type of community started to emerge yeah <laughs> uh if you're going to court yeah I've, I've been there for friends for for court dates uh i've been there to to record and uh take notes uh but we, we, i mean going being there for if you're drunk always has always gone without saying uh in, in our in our communities especially when we have our monthly gatherings you know more than we'll welcome to crash it but we go out a lot we we eat sushi. We go uh, to nightclubs together. We we go. So to you guys life. are actually living life together now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That? We, we have. Uh, yeah. we, right now we have. Uh, that's three. that's where that's where the growth really starts to happen, isn't it? Right. So it's not just uh, just meetings, for example. It's, it's not also, just sitting around philosophizing. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get right. out. It's, it's uh, living life together, going on adventures yeah, exactly. together. I think that's the most important thing. As you guys live life together, you find. I think even in it just in how you live life together, you find you discover new ways to communicate liberty through what you do and how you do it. You have liberty experiences that you can now share with others. It's uh, it's it's for me what you're doing is probably something along the line of what you're doing, and I don't know exactly all of the ramifications, but so far every I'll say I'll qualify it by saying everything I know so far. I would say that what you're doing is probably the most important thing that that folks who want to spread liberty can do, which is actually go out, find folks that live liberty, and live lives with those folks. 
And what will happen is, like for instance, I'm sure you guys have kids. So when you need a babysitter, you know who to call. You're going to call someone that you know is going to do peaceful parenting, right? I mean, that's a huge advantage. If somebody hasn't quite, like for me, I haven't transitioned out of the public school yet. I'm on my way. But for someone like me, if I was in your group, your group would probably be a big help in showing me the, op the options. How do you homeschool? What's the most effective way? How do you, what, what's the paperwork? These are the things that I'm sure you guys are doing, correct? Right, yes. Uh, we, have, I mean, uh, we have a lot of uh, wonderful parents here who, who come with a wealth of information in terms of, uh, of a lot of different areas in terms of uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, I'm pretty jealous of that. I really am. <laughs> I now hate you. I hate you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm that's say that's that our tribe. You know, if, uh, if, if we want to... But, but it's a, just a beautiful thing to have that type of community around you that, I mean, if I... I mean, I live in a community, for instance, where I have very, I'm, I'm going through peaceful parenting. I don't have anybody, in, I, I, I have a friend that lived near me that we've kind of, we kind of crossed over together. So we can kind of relate to each other, but it's much different when you have a larger community. I only have four minutes left here, so I'm going to try to rush through a couple more of these uh, questions here. We have to have you on sometime where we spend like maybe at least half the An show, hour. maybe the whole yeah. show going through these things. Uh, and, I'm, and I do, so, I'm sorry for, for cutting you off for some longer answers. I was I'm trying to get these questions in. Let me, let me try to ask a couple really, uh, oh, here's a really big one for me. I'm sure that you guys are not saints, so you have to have conflict. How do you guys handle conflict within your group? Do you have a system, a methodology, or has something emerged from how you interact with one another? conflict uh the so generally isn't really much of any of that um sometimes you'll find uh minor i wouldn't call it conflicts it's, it's minor discrepancies uh here and there but that's just uh, a lot of people coming with their different norms and different backgrounds especially new members uh trying to adjust and uh get out of the old shed the old cultural norms that they found in uh in, in bad communities out there for example uh, like in this community, you'll never find anything about uh, checking your privilege sort of stuff nonsense, you know, to make you feel guilty and uh, make you feel ashamed. And there's uh, eventually, though, maybe you will come across maybe a conflict with uh, with one member or as, as it goes on. And you just have to kind of I mean, for me, I, I, I give a lot of people, uh, I guess, time patience with a lot of people to figure these things out uh they're coming back in a place in which their parents didn't teach them anything or the parents just beat the hell out of them and it's very difficult for them to uh socialize with other people for example so a lot of people are going to be weird that's that's, that's what you right. want to come across uh and that's that's not well i'm not weird so yeah, so, absolutely. so um, i got one last big fat juicy question and I'm going to let you go with this one, unless you don't want to. I'll let you go with this one until Mr. Producer says music. And that is, what do you hope to, where do you hope to be with your group over the next two years? And then at the end of two years, where, where would you like to see this group? Well, uh, two years from now, we'll be on our, uh, I guess, starting uh, this year, on our, well, I guess, continue our Anarchon, our, our annual Freedom Festival. That's uh, a, a, the Anarchist Festival uh, to go to in terms of, uh, yeah, we want to find a community that will <laughs> never lie to you or deceive to you or trick you. You know, that's, uh, that's anarchy. That's, that's the anarchy tribe we're building here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, good friendships that we have established with other anarchists up, up north as well in like uh, the Northern Vir Virginia Freedom Forum and just slowly building that up. Uh, this is this is a tribe that's going to replace uh, statism. That's going to build the future. This is uh, your, your future friends that uh, we come across, and that's how I feel all the time when I go out there. And when's uh, their when's your freedom? Uh, uh, right festival? now, we're looking tentatively at the Philosopher's Day weekend, which is in October. That weekend uh, that people usually have off, uh, Columbus Day, federal one that we're appropriating. And uh, right now, we're looking tentatively at that Good date, move. which is like uh, the seventh Friday through Monday, uh, the tenth, and. Yeah, I guess in, in that respect, to your so what yeah, so what you say larger, then, uh, hopefully by that time, uh, doing more events in other cities, spreading anarchy in other areas outside of Richmond, helping other people set up their uh, their means to build their own tribe, uh, to combat statism well, in their home. 
Well, we're, 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 you're, you're going to be still with us on the C&D block, but I definitely want to have you back on because I have a lot more questions for uh, how you guys are doing, what you're doing. I, you know, one of these days, um, I'm going to have to come down there and I'm going to have to take that skull, first of all, because that <laughs> skull is totally boss in the background. And the music's in, so we'll see you in. On I, want to say, on the- I want to say one thing. Two years knocking out the uh, Libertarian Gang Party here in Richmond. Yes, good, good move. On the, on the other side, we got the C block, and that will be Mr. Niz, who right now is text messaging Donald Trump, trying to convince him to get out. <laughs> See you on the other side. Welcome back. You're listening to Disassociation Nation, live on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. I'm your host, Niz, here with my co-host, Paul. Hey, Paolo. <laughs> We're joined tonight by our guest, Mr. Cal Moline. I said it right that time, from Liberate Richmond, Virginia. Uh, today's date is the 22nd of January, 2016. Our number to call is 218-895-3818. You can reach us on Skype, FPRN Radio Live. Uh, while we were in the break, Paul, let me know that there was a school shooting in Canada in Saskatchewan. Five dead, two critically injured. Gunman has been captured. Paul, do you have any other details on that? That's it. I got a text message from I have a, a, a an emergency service thing because I do was, newspapers. So I Was that... Do you know if that was at like a, a high school? Elementary school. It was a school. I don't know if it was elementary school or what. Just school is all I said. Mm. So there you go. Breaking news. So you know, remember Canada. See, the problem is that Canada has all those gun control, uh, gun freedoms. Hey, That's maybe somebody got really mad over those six dollar cucumbers. I'll do too soon. In the middle of too, like a- too soon. <laughs> really too soon. <laughs> really too soon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. I got yes. Make bad jokes great All again. Right, fine. I apologize. <laughs> Make bad jokes great again. It was in poor taste. You add great again to anything uh, and it's awesome. Seriously. That's right. Make bad jokes great again. Uh, so we are in the cop block block, and uh, I do have uh, two, two. Did you say the cop block block? Cop this is the cop block, block block. Yes. This is this is a block of cop block stories in the, yes. the C block. Yes, sir. That's correct. But sometimes so it's, we do have other things in the C block, but today cop it's just this. Block. Because we block. got Cal here, and Cal says, the C block better be all about cop block, or I walk. <laughs> Seriously. He yeah. also insisted on a certain flavored Perrier water, which we had to have delivered to him. Otherwise, he wasn't coming on the show. Only red Did M&Ms. Say, M&Ms. Right. Yeah. And only red M&Ms, man. <laughs> yes. Uh so other I have than this, that, he's been perfectly reasonable. <laughs> other, other than that, <laughs> other than like the most unreasonable thing possible, right? Other than being completely unreasonable, he's been totally he's reasonable. totally reasonable. Yeah, he's making yeah. unreasonable great again. You're, is what he's you're, doing. you're having that Trump logic, man. Dude, it's I like, got it there. It's I can't get out of my head. <laughs> Cal, I don't know. Did you see the show? I got a job. I've got. I've got a job. I listen. I'm going to tell you right now. Okay, I job better than anyone else jobs. You know I job so hard that I'm when really I good job, <laughs> you know what? I'm really good at jobs. Most people don't realize this about me, but I am very excellent at jobs. No one can do jobs <laughs> like me. I can do jobs better than Cal. Cal, Cal's a has been. I'm not saying he's a has been. His mother called me. She said, "Yeah, he's a has been." I wouldn't say that, but hey, there you go. There are the facts. I do job better than Cal. That's there right. you go. You've been <laughs> trumped, Cal. You're welcome. <laughs> That's right. I'm not your That's friend, right. guy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I ain't your buddy, pal. <laughs> All righty. Oh then. my God. Okay, so uh, Nashville, Tennessee, May 2014. Ronnie and Lisa Hawkins driving back from his grandfather's funeral in Virginia, uh, targeted by a group of police officers in search of cash. Mr. Producer, if you could please roll clip one. Tonight, a traffic stop along I-40 is raising new questions about your constitutional rights. Among the questions, what happens to your right to say no to a search when police are looking for cash? The traffic stop occurred west of Nashville, along a stretch of interstate in Dixon County that has become well known for a controversial practice known as policing for profit. For three years, our investigation has documented how drug interdiction agencies in that area target out-of-state drivers. Those agencies fund their operations under a state law that lets them seize cash based on the suspicion that it's drug money. 
News Channel 5 chief investigative reporter Phil Williams spent the last five months investigating this latest twist. You know, if you're ever stopped by one of these agencies, you might think you have a constitutional right to say no to a search of your car. But a California couple discovered no doesn't always mean no. Rennie and Lisa Hankins have no fears about traveling the freeways of Southern California. But after what happened in this traffic stop back in May, you know. the interstates of Tennessee are another story. Seems like Nazi Germany. You gotta, you gotta have paperwork and proper authority to come through Tennessee. The San Diego couple have been on the road for days after attending a family funeral in Virginia when they got stopped on the westbound side of I-40 in Dixon County. And I told her, we're going to get pulled over. It came right after they passed an interdiction agent with the 23rd Judicial District Drug Task Force. What made you think he was going to stop you? Because we had out of state license plates and my wife is Hispanic. After separating Lisa from her husband, Come on, have a seat. My for me. It's safer there. supposedly so he could write her a warning ticket for a traffic violation, the agent began repeatedly questioning her. Then he had a favor to ask. We say there's not anything illegal in it. Do you mind if I search it to make sure? I, I, I just feel like he was harassing me, you know, wanted me to say yes, I can, you can search my car. I'm asking you for permission to search your vehicle today. And you are well within your right to say no, and you can say yes. It's totally up to you whether you want to show cooperation or not. So why not say yes? I mean, there's no reason for him to search my car. I am asking you that because I do believe, not being honest with me. Why wouldn't I be honest? I don't know. He died on May 1st. The officer did not believe their story that they had been to a funeral for Ronnie's grandfather, even though a quick search of the internet would have proved they were telling the truth. You have to give me a yes or no. I do need an answer so I can figure out whether I need a dog to go around it or not. I was getting upset because, you know, he was kept on, like, asking me over and over, and I said, you have no reason to search my car. You're ready, dog. That's when agents brought out a drug dog to sniff around their car. If that dog does not hit they don't get to search your car. No. There's no probable cause. But that's exactly what happened. We ran a dog and the dog's alerted on the vehicle, so we're going to be searching, okay? And whatever's in there, we're going to find in just a second. Ronnie was furious. There's never been any drugs in that vehicle and never will be. It turns out the man that the task force stopped knows a thing or two about law enforcement himself. He's a federal police officer here at the Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego. You got the drug task drug task force, you out here harassing me and my wife, but no, I'm just coming back from a funeral. That's exactly how I expect most police officers to have uh, okay. And you're convinced they cued that dog to hit. Yes. One hundred percent. There's no doubt in my mind. They cued that dog. Take a look in slow motion. The dog passes an open window on the passenger side with no alert. The handler then leads the dog around the front. Then on the driver's side, he turns his body around and gestures towards the window. Suddenly, the dog sits. That's the alert. Just like a child. You can make a child say anything you want. You can make a dog do whatever you want, too, if you train them the right way. And you are convinced that's what happened here? Yes. He threw a line about the dog alert. For almost an hour... Yeah, it just, it ought to be here. The two agents searched the Hankins' belongings. Ain't making me hairy, don't you know where we're going? Yeah. Even tearing apart part of the dash of Lisa's new car. That really pissed me off when you started, like, ripping everything out of my car. You felt violated. Yeah, I felt violated, and it just, you know, he didn't want to hear it. And when Ronnie insisted there were no drugs, the agent confided he wasn't really expecting any. Well, I'll be honest with you. Would you go in this direction? I would think you'd have drugs in the car. And you know, you know, money. Money. I knew right then they were looking for money to fund their operations. And, and what made you pay. think that? Because they're not worried about the drugs. Mm. They're worried about the money. Is that number one? Yes. When agents couldn't find anything, they wrote up this report to justify the dog's alert, saying they found marijuana debris on both the driver and passenger floorboards. We showed the report to the couple. It's just them trying to cover their backside. Rennie noted that the drug dog had passed by the open passenger window and did not alert. The truth they say all agents saw inside the car was grass from the cemetery where they had buried Ronnie's grandfather. It makes me angry that someone would attack my character because not only that attacks my character, that could cost me my job. As for her experience, Lisa Hankins said she knows one thing for sure. I know I will never drive to Tennessee again. <laughs> the last time.
Now, the dog handler involved emphatically insists through his boss that he did not give that dog any sort of command to alert on the car. The Hankins say they're still suspicious, Rory. It's amazing to watch that. That officer, why was he so insistent to search the car? Well, that agent said he thought they looked nervous, but the Hankins say they were just tired and jittery after having been on the road for days. And Ronnie says after having served in Iraq, that's just the way he comes across. And you took the video to a nationally respected expert. That's right. And he believes that the handler may have inadvertently cued that dog to alert. That part of our investigation is tomorrow night at 6. All right. Thanks so much, Phil. So, you know, it's a little bit disturbing when, when you have, you know, a, a police officer comparing other police officers to, to you know, Nazi Germany. Uh, I mean, you... you you see this this stuff all the time. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many times over the last uh, year or so that I've read articles about. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't think of what it's called now. Uh, uh, civil asset forfeiture. Oh, and right. and this this is like along the same lines there, where they 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 they're just looking for some cash. That's it, man. Road pirates. I mean, there's no difference between what happened to this couple and and legitimate and man and piracy. I mean, like the 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 Somalian pirates. Uh, what was that? What was that stupid propaganda film that they? Uh, Captain Ahab. Captain Ron. Captain yeah, Ron. yeah. Say Captain <laughs> Ron. Maybe I'm mixing films. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Captain there's not Ron. really there's not really any difference between you know <laughs> piracy and what these. Police officers are doing. I mean, they, they stopped these these people. They they committed no no actual crime has been committed. Uh, these cops are just pulling them over so that they can harass them and hopefully steal their money. Yeah, Canada not anything. gave I think, out a warning. I think your silence means you approve. Just saying. <laughs> I was gonna say uh, Canada, silence is compliance, man. Go ahead. You you were mentioning Canada earlier in regards to uh, a shooting. Um, but yeah, they, they gave out a warning uh, over a year ago, uh, warning tourists from Canada entering the United States to be wary of uh, your money being robbed by police extortions here because it's so it beca it's become so uh, extravagant an amount of these particular cases that are going on. The, the government put out a warning <laughs> against that. Uh, yeah, so active forfeiture, civil forfeiture, uh, this, this stuff has been a way to kind of prep up uh, their failing uh, monopoly on security because it's not consumer driven. The only way they can kind of continue with that funding as it continues to grow in costs is to continue to rob from more and more people. Uh, this is where you get uh, what children for prison uh, incidences that's going on with judges uh, selling off kids even if uh, you know, for, for, that, for nothing. Uh, that just, that actually, that just, uh, there was a case just like that. Um, in uh, in Pennsylvania, in the Wyoming Valley, uh, I'm 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 formerly a resident of the uh, of the Wyoming Valley, the Wilkesbury <coughs> Scranton area in Pennsylvania, and there was a big uh, a big scandal going on uh, there with uh, Judge Chivarella, who was in uh, he had invested in a private juvenile detention center. Uh, he was a sitting judge for the county, and he was sending these uh, th these kids uh, that were being sent before him for minor infractions. I mean, stuff like. Uh, you know, violations of curfew and sentencing them to weeks and months in a juvenile detention center because he was getting kickbacks from sending these kids to, to, to juvenile detention for, for little things, nonsense things. And, and I, the, the, I, the whole, the, well, the, 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 uh, the entire scandal really broke loose, exploded out, out into the mainstream media uh, when a young man that was in, I believe he was, he was put in this juvenile detention center um, for... Uh, for a, uh, a curfew violation, and uh, he ended up getting in a fight while uh, while locked up here in this uh, you know this uh, uh, kids jail, uh, and he was killed, and uh, that's when it broke loose. There's actually uh, a, a documentary, Kids for Cash, uh, if you're interested, if if you haven't I, seen it or if you're I, not from I was actually case. I was actually a victim of this, not this particular one. When I was nine years old, my brother, my sister, and I stole a bike and my mother was told it, it, this was a not not quite the same kind of setup as what you had here but my mother was told that we would either go to juvenile detention for stealing a bike first offense never did anything like this before or they would uh that we should be sent to an orphanage even though we weren't orphans 
and they were getting kickbacks to send people to this orphanage, Scotland School for Veterans Children, and I was there for uh, three years, three, four years. And when I first went to Scotland School of Veterans Children, the first thing that I got introduced to was I was in a bathroom and I got to see one boy uh, basically coerce another boy into raping another boy in front of us. That was my introduction to the school. And I only found out years later that I, most of the kids were there from Philly and they were, they were really violent kids that were in that school. I, uh, fortunately, I didn't know about it at the time. So I actually was on the receiving end of this scam. So you're like a legitimate Oliver Twist. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I am. More, more pudding, please, Mom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that gives me street oh. bed right now. Uh, oh, my God. Right That's, that sounds horrible, yeah. man. That's... Yeah, it, was, it was pretty horrible, yeah. It's, and you know what? It, it certainly indoctrinated me to accept authority. <laughs> Let's just say I, I, I very much... Uh, uh, I won't say respected authority, but I certainly feared authority because I, I was uh, on the brute end of it. I mean, you, you, you know, you're accepted not so much authority, right, in, uh, in the good sense, but in, in the bad sense, you respected monsters who could very much well do that to you, right? Oh, so absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, that's horrible. No, that's... Uh, I'm... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, no, I was, was going to say, I've, I've heard of uh, this, this other star, the, the police dog, uh, you know, sniffing on command and that, that happens all the time uh you know you're mentioning like this news story coming up we've been investigating for a few years now it's like there's there's been evidence of this stuff going on for for decades uh and not just in one particular uh region you know when, when are these news organizations going to get the hint that the common denominator of all these kind of thefts is going on the biggest the biggest uh, organization that's doing a lot of this robbery and, and murder and theft and kidnapping is is the government um You'll never hear about that. There's enough evidence right now at this point to kind of to, to get that well, picture on hand. And and speaking of speaking of uh, uh, you know murder and outright violence committed by the state, uh, they have this case of uh, uh, Shurabesh uh, Patel from Alabama who was assaulted oh, by yeah, Alabama this police. Uh, this was November. Uh, this was back in um, I believe this was 2014 also. Uh, but there's an update here posted from 2015. Uh, Mr. Producer, if you could go ahead and play uh, clip two. In his weekly rehab sessions, he's starting to walk again after he was pushed to the ground by police earlier this year. Uh, he says, once I was brought down, my whole body went numb. I remember the ambulance taking me to the hospital. The incident left the 58-year-old grandfather partially paralyzed. Suresh Bhai Patel had moved to America from Gujarat in India to help take care of his young grandson. And it was in February of this year that he went for a morning walk here on this street in a suburb of Huntsville, Alabama. A stroll close to his son's house was part of the daily ritual for Mr. Patel. He'd only been in the country a week, but that morning a neighbor spotted him and called the police. We've had a guy, he was doing it yesterday and today, just kind of wandering around in driveways. What does he look like? Uh, he's a skinny black guy. I don't, I, I've lived here for four years. I've never seen him before. Hi, bud. Talk to you real quick. Officers arrived shortly after and began asking Suresh by questions. But unable to speak or understand English, he struggled to respond. What's your name? He's saying no English. He doesn't understand. Okay. India. India? Okay. Rona, but Upana said I. I I went for a walk along the road, and while I was walking, they were shouting, so I stopped. They came to me as they took a couple steps. I said, My house, 148, 148, and I pointed. They came, they grabbed my hand. They searched my pockets, my handkerchief fell out, and I was brought down on the grass. As his son, what went through your mind when you watched that video for the first time? Uh, it, it was a very uh, devastating video that I saw. How come you just walk in and uh, break somebody's neck? 
27-year-old police officer Eric Parker was fired and charged with third-degree assault. He's also been charged in a federal court with excessive use of force. The case has been tried twice, and both times the juries failed to reach a unanimous decision. Is there anything you want to say about the outcome today? No, to this time, thank you, yeah. Mr Parker said he didn't mean to hurt Mr Patel, but had acted in the interest of officer safety after Mr Patel refused to comply with his requests. During their arguments, the defence said, When you come to the US, we expect you to follow our laws and speak our language. Mr Patel bears as much responsibility for this as anyone. Do I feel angry? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I do feel angry this, uh, because of my dad already mentioned it five times that he doesn't speak English. And now we are using that as an excuse of a uh, force that has been used. Then, yes, uh, I'm disappointed. Mr. Patel enjoys being with his grandson. His wife recently joined him from India too. He plans to stay in the U.S. despite all that's happened. And how is your dad doing day by day? Oh, it's hard for him. Uh, so he was an independent man before, and suddenly you change uh, one person's life. But slowly he's making a progress and getting independence, slowly. But still, he's not 100% yet, and we don't know if he is going to get the 100%. As he makes a steady recovery, Suresh Bhai Patel told me he thinks what Eric Parker did was wrong, but says he doesn't feel angry. Regine Vibianalvin, BBC News, Madison, Alabama. I think the most egregious part of this is the, uh, the speak our language, uh, the blaming the victim. Uh, How long has to, he been there? Exalt. How long was he there? A week. A week? Yeah, he was in the United States a week. Wow. But, you know, I, I, I think this starts with the guy that makes the call. If I see a dude walking down my street and they happen to be of an ethnicity of any kind and I don't recognize them, I honestly don't feel compelled to call the police if somebody is just walking down the freaking street. I think that's where it starts. It starts with that phone call. Yeah, Why do you make that phone call? Yeah, that, that, those are murder boxes that you're calling up. Uh, whatever you see around right. the city, yeah, the, the, you're calling out murderers to hurt people, and that's that's the effect. What are the <laughs> you're, you're you're granting an invitation to death to whoever you call the cops to? That's their job to hurt people and harm them. And it's always again, it's for officer safety, not for you. They don't look at it in a way. If it was a private security, you know, my job is to make sure you're safe. It's like bodyguards, right? And they go out of their way, even if they have to take a bullet. Cops don't have to. They look at you as a potential, uh, I guess criminal and in their point of view everyone's a criminal in, in the view of uh, these police extortionists and so they have to act appropriately that you are a bad guy Every, everybody around me are potential bad guys um so there's no incentive there to protect you over their over themselves uh, that's not their vocation that's not they're not consumer driven that's not the position i mean you have again many supreme court rulings have already uh, come to that decree that the police extortionists have no obligation to protect your life, liberty, or property does not exist. And that lie that's been perpetuated and that you have rights and all this stuff, it continues that facade and continues to get people hurt, murdered, injured, uh, lost of loved ones. Uh, and that's the stuff, the, um, this information that we have to kind of go out and advocate yeah. and, and, and against, provide real information. So Cal, you're not protected here. Cal, just, your, your, uh, your connection is, is, is dropping in and out here. Um, you look like Nosferatu we'll, right now. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think what we're going to have to do is we're, we're going to have to um, we're going to have to disconnect you from the call and then reconnect you uh, during the break uh, coming up. So if you want to just hang out for a couple minutes, we'll get you right back on. We just it's it uh, everything you're saying is kind of digitized, so I don't think the audience is really going to be able to. Uh, to make it out, so uh, we'll we'll bring it back on here after the break, if that's okay. Yeah, rise of that, man. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I, I I agree with what with what uh, what Cal is saying. I mean, when you, um, and I mean you're you're right as well, Paul. I mean this this whole incident starts with the way that that uh, gentleman made that initial call and the way that he portrayed uh, this elderly Indian man um, who's gentleman. just going for a walk and he's portraying this. Uh, this gentleman to the uh, to the 911 dispatch center, like as if this guy is like you know uh, flashing gang symbols peeking in everybody's windows, 
And, uh, you know, so when the when the when the police officers show up, they, they're anticipating this already. But at the same time, when you see it like an 80 some year old Indian man who doesn't speak English, I mean, you, you, you you know, you, you ought to know that. I know, I know when know, I see an old guy. Being a rational person, you don't freaking choke slam him on his face when, into the dirt. When I see an old guy walking down the street, I don't care what, what ethnicity is, white, black, or otherwise. I see an old dude tottering down the street, I'll call him the cops. Ain't no way. Ain't no way an old guy has any business walking down the street. He's casing the joint. Seriously. Those <laughs> yeah, guys, yeah. they run in gangs. You see so one you of better- them? So you better get them. guys come back. You better I mean, get them, hey, man. You better get them, get them, get them. I don't know why they even talked to him. They should have just jumped out of the car and shot him. Um, <laughs> and, of course, I'm being facetious uh, in saying that. Um, but, yeah, it, it – go ahead. Go I'm ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. No, I mean, this is just this is just exceptionally egregious. And the fact that, that you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the jury, um, the court said – that uh, you know you have a, a responsibility when you come to our country to follow our laws and to speak our language. Well, for God's sakes, the guy was here a week to help his grandson. A week, and he's choke slammed. Freedom, choke slammed into America. the dirt for Welcome freedom. To America. Um, I mean, this is absolutely, absolutely terrible. My heart breaks for this family. You, you, you got to Google it. And I mean, uh, YouTube, uh, because they, there's more video that really shows the fullness of, of the violence of it. Yeah, we got the music coming in, Mr. Niz. Oh, well, I guess that's it. I mean, but I definitely would recommend take take go to YouTube, YouTube this, take a look at it, listen to it. I mean, it really, really is uh, a terrible, terrible example of what is becoming normal police policy in the United States. If you don't think that you live in a police state, this is a perfect example that should open your eyes to say, I think you think wrong. Uh, Stick around. We'll be right back with the D block and we're going to uh, talk on the other side. Real quick on the other side, we will be talking about why are libertarians embracing embracing nationalism. Joined by my co-host, Paul. I'm uh, playing a ham sandwich for this segment. Oh, a ham sandwich. Uh, We're joined by... Cal, Cal Molinae, um, I hear a wicked bad echo, guys. Somebody's That's got your you. speakers on. That's all you. That's all you, sir. No speakers here. <laughs> it's all me. Um, <laughs> they hate us for our freedom. <laughs> yeah, make America great. Us. Force them to say Merry Christmas. Yeah. Um, so, so we got an interesting D block, right? We do, yeah. Um, you had put together a couple videos here for us. I believe. Why don't, why, don't, why don't you bring this this here in since you did the video clips? I did the video point. clips, man. Dude, I did the video clips. And actually, no, I'm not going to take credit for these. Niz did the video clips. I had nothing to do with these. I did not. <laughs> I said, dude, we shouldn't do this, dude. He said, we're doing this. So yeah. what we're doing well, is... What did, you is say? what did you say in the pre-show, Paul? We, we want to keep these things low-key. <laughs> we're, we're doing a low-key approach here. So we're just going to cover a couple things that Stefan Molyneux and, and Chris Cantwell have said recently. Just keeping it low key here. So, so brace yourself, Cal. Before you we start, can I run. preface? Uh, you can preface. Go ahead. Yeah, all, right. all right. First of all, there are no ANCAPs uh, that support immigration ban. Uh, there are status and there are status in denial that support political rulers. Uh, the wardens of the prison cage of, uh, that they are jealously protecting. There are states that support slave masters to stop bringing in more tax slaves and their prison pens. That is the only thing that's going on out there. The only well, borders that matter are private ones. Political borders is demarcate the boundaries of your free-range cage, right? So don't act like zoo animals jealously protecting your prison bars because that is exactly what people do when they want to bring in the state, especially if you're going to call yourself an ANCAP, a libertarian. Let me, let me any clarify. Any so other political self-proclaimed <laughs> ANCAPers. How about that? Just like there are Christians no, who state, don't, don't believe right. in Christ. Uh, and, there are... Yeah, denial. you got to call them out for yeah. what they are. Just like an- ANCOMs, you call them out for what they are, commies. Commies, man. Commies. So I was going to keep awesome. it all low. So key, you, but Cal's like, no, man, so we're you, going hardcore. Man. So you heard it. So you heard it on disassociation. So, so you know, Cal made these videos. Molyneux, Molyneux Cal actually and made these videos. He said, you put these on or I walk. That's right. Molyneux like, okay, <laughs> man. and Cantwell okay. are fakers. They are statists. They I are not libertarian or, or, or ANCAP or, or anarcho anything. They are states. The anarcho if, police if they will subscribe. come for you. 
Niz, the anarcho police will come for you. That's uh, that's the least of my words, man. <laughs> Dude, you, you keep using this word anarchist. Yeah. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> okay, so, come on, play these videos. So let's go ahead, Mr. Producer Man. Why don't, what we're going to do is we're going to play clip one, and we're going to talk like, about that, and then we're going to play like clip eggs. two. So go ahead, clip. I like eggs. Folks, we present to you a brief highlight of the essential arguments that Christopher Cantwell makes for libertarians to support the use of government to limit immigration. I like eggs. For a libertarian, the answer may at first seem quite obvious, open borders. Governments have this nasty habit of building walls to keep people in far more than to keep them out. Arbitrary geopolitical boundaries seem quite senseless when drawn by criminal enterprises calling themselves nation states. Governments obtain everything they have from coercive violence and thus have no legitimate claim to control what are commonly considered public spaces. We'll decide for ourselves who comes onto our property, thank you very much. A practical and strategic problem then presents itself. If one is working toward building a more libertarian society, the importation of millions of communist, socialists, and religious fanatics, many of whom think the state should impose the will of their deity on society, does not advance their purposes. I like eggs. Increased burdens on welfare rolls mean higher taxes. Increased crime means a greater police presence. Depressed wages means more people looking to government for solutions. Changing demographics in the age of political correctness means racial tension. I like eggs. Everybody in the society becomes increasingly miserable, and in their ignorance of economics, they do not blame the minimum wage and welfare system, but rather demand their expansion. At this point, the misery of the society suggests to smart and productive people that this is not a good place to live, and the only migrants who continue to flow into the place are the lowest of the low. They breed, not only with each other, but with the natives, thereby irreparably lowering the genetic quality of the people in that society. The migrants, readily identified by their skin color, language, and culture, rightly become seen as a scourge on that society. If the natives refuse to do business with the migrants, they are branded as racist and even sued or imprisoned for being so bigoted. So while the libertarian theorist may comfortably sit back from a distance and wag his finger at the government, the libertarian who wants to stop the suffering has no such option. There is an immediate problem, not in some dystopian future or some Ayn Rand novel or some economics textbook, but in the real world right now. His list of options do not consist of principled or unprincipled behavior, but of policy changes or racial warfare. I don't taste no milkshake there, bub. There, bub. I'll taste no milkshake. So, Cal, there, I, I, I gotta, I got, I gotta let Cal go ahead. Cal, go ahead. Just right. do it. Uh, it's just pretty much a, it's, it's a critique on what the, uh, what's going on in, in this uh, particular. Because I, I don't want to listen to, to Cantwell. Uh, so I, I want to know too much about, except for sometimes uh, what shows up on news feeds. Uh, are you saying that he advocates then for? Uh, well, I guess I've heard he advocates for Trump, and Trump is more of a uh, closed border sort of kind of guy, right? Yeah, yeah, advocating for Trump. Right, right. I mean, all right. So, I mean, so right, right off the bat, I mean, there's no. I mean, public spaces is just land ripe for homesteading that a criminal organization of murderers and thieves and and rapists prevent peaceful people. That's all public spaces, right? And these kind of borders. That's what. Uh, you know, there's no tradition in choice of support. You know, there's no, there's nothing you can do in terms of having any kind of control what the, your, the prison wardens of your cage will do. Their, their job is to hurt you. Their job is to put you in a, in a desperate position in, in such a place that most people are right now, especially throwing people into cages for victimless crimes. That's, that, we're, we're in a prison, right? So anarchy means without political rulers to advocate against would-be slave masters doesn't give you the particular context in how to free yourself from, from bondage, that's true, but at least let's start off with principles. Let's start with something that's never been done before. I mean, he talks about no option. There is an option right there, right? Live, live your life principally in, in which you advocate for and following your words and following that commitment, choice, or actions. The, but, uh, but, but Cal, what about the gene pool? What about the gene pools? So, yeah, the gene pool. I mean, you got to keep the gene pool pure. That's, that's, that's liberty, right? That's a liberty thing, right? Yeah, right. I mean, when he was talking about, they just kind of sounded like uh, the American Indians here as well. Uh, not that they're any better than their European counterparts. You know, here in uh, the Americas, they also practiced uh, taxation. They called it a tribute. They practiced uh, genocide, mass uh, murders of uh, cultural groups, uh, enslavement, <laughs> uh, human sacrifice. 
Uh, they don't know more better than that. Uh, the Europeans just had better, more efficient ways of hurting people. Uh, in regards to statism. Uh, that's why when they came here to, to the Americas, it's very easy to adopt those social norms because they've already been having this relationship of a slave master and slave relationship. Uh, these so just, people just, just come across the Atlantic. I just need to get you on the record, Cal. I think I just, this very important, very important distinction here, folks. This is a great libertarian moment. Judging people by their genetic makeup is not liberty. I'm, what do you say? Is, is, are we going to make it that sense? Sounds to me We're, what's going on here is uh, someone advocating uh, their fetish to be ruled by white people. Great, cool. you know that's the free society you see yourself under. You want to be ruled by by people, a particular a particular uh, pigment, skin color type. Uh, have a safe word, right? Uh, make sure that everything's voluntary and consensual. But outside from that, that's all I'm hearing is uh, someone sharing their fetish, uh, their weird, kinky, bias and desire to be uh, dominated by Donald Trump. And just so, just so everybody knows that uh, Mr. Cantwell did not pick that music. That music was picked for him. I don't know if that was a violation. Don't of... lie. He he picked. He called you up on the he phone. Totally, he totally. He said, did. "Listen, I know you're gonna bash me, and this is the music I want. Circus music played don't while you bash me. When I talk about racial purity, I want I... to sound happy." <laughs> Uh, why don't we hear from Why don't we hear from Mr. Stefan Molyneux? Don't, don't go there yet. I would just want to set this up oh. real quick. Okay. Uh, in this clip, uh, what I captured was Molyneux was making in this particular. I, I listened to this whole video. It was over an hour long. In this video, he doesn't uh, outright advocate for the government to actually, uh, you know, in, enforce immigration. But essentially, he makes an argument which if you extrapolate it out, even if you're a quote-unquote libertarian, you should be concerned about the undesirables coming into your community. Bad things are going to happen. And this uh, uh, demonstrates that. And also, he was also worthy of the I like eggs clip. So he got the I like eggs clip. I like so eggs. I like eggs. Go ahead. Hit that clip number two. For closed borders and government intervention to block immigration by the one and the only Stefan Molino. I like eggs. I don't mean to shock you. I, we're trying not to shock you, but if you love freedom, you're gonna like people who also love freedom. I like Native-born Hispanics, oh, 66% want a larger government. Only 28% want a smaller government. Foreign-born Hispanics, are you ready? Hold under your sombrero. 81, count them, 81% of foreign-born Hispanics want a larger government. And 12% of them want a smaller government. I like eggs. If you feel that the giant welfare, warfare, military, industrial, prison, industrial nightmare complex of U.S. hegemony is a little bit too big, if you look at the American flag and see a slowly flapping Death Star, well, having a lot of immigrants coming in, particularly from Mexico, is not going to help you shrink the size and power of the state. I like eggs. Now, here's the challenge. Everyone's complaining about growing wealth disparity in the United States. But at the same time, they want more immigration from relatively low IQ third world peasant cultures. You can't have both. At a time when intelligence is being more richly rewarded in the world economy, at a time when more intelligence means more wealth, and the world is getting more complex, and business is getting more complex, and the nuance of language is becoming more complex, it really doesn't make any sense to import these um, low IQ, illiterate to English, Third world peasant culture people. I don't taste no milkshake there, bub. I don't taste no milkshake there. So, so, Cal. so, Cal, I'm expecting blood to shoot out of your eyes. <laughs> is there, is there something churning uh, inside right now? No, uh, I, I haven't listened to his stuff in years now, so it's not a. Uh... Well, I don't necessarily. Well, he still mean... is just as pompous as he always was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, so a lot of this sort of... stuff doesn't come surprise to 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 people who who follow a lot of folks who've kind of abandoned principles for politics, uh, and their implied uh, position and support for uh, this. These positions have been known for quite some time. So has Molyneux since uh, what 2012. Uh, in Canwell, of course, going to the Free State, a place to advocate for political. Uh, uh, solutions, right? You know, there's there's no factual evidence in history to show that politics, voting, government has ever set anyone free. None, 
right? So, so the fact that you were born a slave today, the fact that you were born a tax slave, that you, you still breed, you're, you're still a tax slave right now, implies that all political strategies and, t and ways to try to achieve freedom through politics have failed. Failed. All right, so why continue to, to perpetuate the, the lies, the propaganda that otherwise uh, history has shown to have never worked? Uh, and there's only one, one reason, and that the reason is that uh, you've already given up on your community. You've already stopped believing that your community can rise above and above the, the pettiness of a statism and have a, at least a good understanding of what is freedom. Um, when, you, when people bring up uh, statistics, for example, they forget that the people who are being pulled are not provided option C, none of the above. You know, you, the same sort of statistics you can show is like, well, females are less inclined to freedom because most of them advocate for the criminalization of cannabis, whereas males advocate for uh, the legalization. But they forget that legalization is still another form of violence, right? If you don't obey and command a follower or, or, or orders, you'll still be extorted, you'll still be thrown into a cage. It's just it's a, it's a sleight of hand uh, gesture. That's all. It's replacing violence with another kind of violence. Just still be robbed. If you still don't follow the rules, we're still thrown into a cage. All right. That's also something I'm going to advocate for, the legalization of, uh, of cannabis, which then necessarily then implies an advocation of support of a political yeah, There's always a trade-off with that, isn't there? Legalization of cannabis also means that we accept taxation. We right. accept yeah, yeah, yeah. We empower the state through you know, our weed. Right. Which, this, necessarily, right, which means that you have to necessarily imply that you have to support political rulers and slave masters. You have to support their political uh, party campaigns and their uh, political gang affiliations. Right, uh, the whole uh, goes against the very tenet of what is anarchism. And no wonder well, has anywhere. I, I, Whenever, when you advocate politics, you you forsake everyone else because you believe that you just can't get it. Uh, I believe I mentioned he mentioned once a while ago that only one out of ten thousand people can maybe understand this sort of stuff. One out of ten thousand people. Right. So I you're getting see. something right there. When, when Molyneux and Cantwell, when they cite intelligence, to me what it sounds like they're saying is unless you have a high enough IQ, you can't understand liberty. But I well, think not, that not, we not only that, it goes, it, goes, it goes further than that because in the two videos that we just watched, they not only said that if you don't have a high enough IQ, you can't understand liberty, but they went a step further and, and, and went as far as to say, right. if you don't think like I do, then you don't deserve the same freedom that I do. You don't deserve the aim, same opportunity to choose freedom, is essentially. But my point is... Free that, crime minority report-ish, yeah, well, well, sort of. My, my, my point is this, that if it's true that you have to have a certain level of intelligence... To understand and appreciate liberty, we're all screwed. We're done. I don't know what we're doing here. We're beating our head against the wall. Let's just hail state because you're never going to see, I don't think you're going to see a world where you're going to see a bunch of brainiacs walking around. Uh, it's it, Actually, it's one of my pet peeves with the, the Ancapistan in general is the high level of intellectualization that isn't backed up with practical living, but that's another matter. I believe that human beings, like I, 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 I have met people that do not have a high IQ that in a lot of facets of life are so much more smarter than I am. Well, so I'm going to say more smarty. Right, well, you can but have an IQ. A, but wait, wait, let me finish here. What I'm saying so is that it is in human, we're both waiting to get in here. <laughs> it is human nature to want to be left alone and to leave others alone, to live and let live. That is human nature. You don't have to have a high IQ to, to have that compulsion within you. It has to be beat out of you. Which it's it not has. hard. It, they, they, ever, they, they have a very elitist attitude. This, it doesn't take a high IQ. This isn't difficult stuff that we're dealing with here. Right. It's very, very easy. It, it boils down to don't hit, hurt, or kill other people and don't steal their stuff. It's simple. It doesn't get any, any, any easier than that. You don't have to have 165 uh, point IQ to understand don't hit anyone, don't kill anyone, and don't steal their stuff. This isn't rocket science. Right. I can't also, see uh, anything uh, there but a bright white phone. Wait, I don't know. Hold on, hold on. See that? There we go. <laughs> Somebody posted that on our page as a response to our show. <laughs> right, right. It's if a, immigration is a, is a problem of importing uh, bad ideas and bad cultural norms, you know, they, they forget that in, in Europe there's nothing but Scandinavian uh, socialist utopias <laughs> all over the place, right? Uh, you forget that, uh, you know, what, what immigration group imported the idea of the National uh, Socialist Workers' Party in Germany? What, what Was that? Uh, the Germans imported that. 
Yeah, who imported that? No, that that came from a, a white yeah. dominant culture there in, in Europe. You know, yeah. that, uh, you know, they could be as authoritative and cruel and disgusting as this as any other culture. This is not something that's uh, particular one ge- geographic region in another. They still practice the same thing. Is this some are just more efficient than the others? And, uh, and, that goes, so, and that just fits in the face of saying that people can't learn. People can't uh, come, come to an understanding of any of this information. Again, that goes to an abandonment of, every, of your community, of everyone around you. That, that says you've already given up on, 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 on the world. When you, when you have it okay for politics, that's what applies because you don't have to talk to anyone in that regard. You just hide behind a, a, a booth, a murder booth. To me, when, what you're saying is, is voluntarism doesn't work. I was just pretending. Well, no, uh, the thing is, uh, his solution is, that you will never have freedom in your lifetime. It'll be a generation thing, something you'll never live to see or taste or, or have. It's something that uh, remotely not possible for you. Maybe in the future. Not, not as long as but you have these the barriers solution, around you. The solution, though, is to donate FDR. That's it. It's your best chance of freedom. Uh, abandon well, I all of that. What, what is your best chance of freedom? Your best friend, chance of freedom is to donate to FDR. Uh, oh, that's, that's the solution. No, no, you, you put out a video a while ago. Uh, that says, you know, no, 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 you, you can't talk to people. Only one out of 10,000 people can get it. If you're looking for uh, political solutions, you know, they don't work. But if you want a real solution, donate to FDR. And yeah, that's the only chance you've got. And it's, it's not, that's something you'll ever see in your lifetime. But well, you know, he'll, here, disciple you. He'll, he'll disciple you, and you can practice the UPB and uh, be free from within or something. This, right. this sort of stuff comes out of desperation, uh, the same kind of uh, thing I've seen in, in a lot of uh, older libertarians out there, like Doug Casey, you know, calling people monkeys because they can't get it. Uh, your lack of uh, being socially inept and persuading someone and introducing ideas in your own community, it's not, it sounds like a, a problem that you need to work on, you know, it's just sort of turning towards complete abandonment towards everyone else. Um, I, I mean, again, relying on polls on people who have only been shown, especially through government schools, that option A is government, option B is no government. No one's ever been introduced to anarchy. No one's ever been introduced to option C, none of the And I've shown uh, through my views to my spread anarchy that people can get, that people can understand the argument against the state, that people have these moral principles that they already hold. All you have to do is just go out there and talk to them and, and in a way that they can understand it, and in a way that, uh, that they can come to the same conclusions. See, I don't I, see I, I, for everyone. When you talk about Campbell talking about, well, my solution is to murder cops. Well, then, then, then follow you. Follow, follow. Go ahead and leave that. Right? That's not going to stop you. Right? It's like uh, people advocate for those ideas. Well, be on the forefront of that. You know, uh, take a leadership role. Be the first one to, to shoot a cop. If that's what your your solution is. Well, I was right. to see that when he brought when, he, when the cops came in and. Um, uh, there's one video, uh, I think it's the only one I saw in which people were arguing at a mall and he takes out a, a camera phone and people were, are coming at him or being upset that he's recording it because they were having an argument and then the cops start coming in and all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's like their best friend, right? This is very, their, their, their attitude completely changed. Yeah, I, 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 I think that what we're looking for is, we're not looking for intelligent people. Not that I don't have anything against intelligent people, but we're looking for the... Uh, we're looking for the, the explorers, the people who are willing to go out a little bit ahead of everybody else and explore and test new ground. And what's going to happen, like with what you're doing, Cal, you are going to start to demonstrate what it means to live liberty. And as more impor- as these groups grow and the networks grow and people on the outside, what, what people are going to look at from the outside looking in is, are you guys living more of the life that you want to live than I am? And if that's true, you know what? I I want to see what you're doing. And it and it's not the rocket scientists and the brainiacs that that need to see that. It's anybody, anybody that looks and sees you and says, "Dude, they're doing something right. How are you doing this? I like the life that you're leading." That's how liberty is going to emerge from from the bottom up, not by picking the smart people and walling off your community and empowering the state to protect you. While you go and work well, to well, actually well, undermine the state, well, well, you I think go, the state's going to catch on to that. Well, you go and completely betray every principle that you're supposed to be, you know, well, yeah. mirroring in your own life. I mean, it, this, like, is this is absolute. Yeah, this is it's baloney, man. It's absolute baloney. I mean, it it, it doesn't get any more uh, any more fake than 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 this. I mean, this is, uh, uh, you know, very hypocritical. I mean, on 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 one side, you're saying that you advocate. That you're an advocate for liberty, and then on the other side of it, you, you're turning around and out of the same side of your mouth, you're advocating against liberty, and it's just, 
It's it's insane. It's absolutely insane. It's insane. It's dishonest. It's 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 uh, it's uh, liberty disrespectful. It's liberty for me and not for thee. Well, exactly. That's why I said if you don't think like me and you don't and you're not as and I don't deem you as intelligent as I am, then you don't deserve the same freedom that I deserve. And we're going to, you know, minority report, pre-crime you, build a wall, and say we don't want you here. Because I don't right. think you're as smart as I am. Right. And when it goes to that stuff in terms of uh, races, you sound no different than the people who justice, justice works, who clamor for, you know, that's what you're their, their copy. And the only celebration that they're doing behind that is the celebration of acts of birth. Right? Mm. So these people clamoring, well, you know, these, these white cultures, these white races, you're here. You have nothing to do with the achievements of these other people who, who created uh, this, whatever technology or, or, or construction or building or, or, or literature that they were. You have nothing to do with that. You have, you have laid no hand in part of that. It's like, uh, again, like, you know, like people who go to soccer games and say, oh, well, we beat you. <laughs> they took no part in it. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, you weren't, you weren't even on the field. Hey, I do that. I do that. I'm guilty. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh. you're, you're, you're being more and more different than collectivists. And that has nothing to do with you. You're not. He did not lay a hand in, in helping uh, the, the Ford and T100 uh, Ford engine being creation to help uh, alleviate poverty. That had nothing to do with you. Uh, Einstein for all of that stuff. No. That's, that's, again, that's the whole thing. That's the same thing as uh, social justice warriors do. You know, I, I, I got to cut you off because the music is in. I just want to say real quick, thank you, Cal, so much. Uh, Cal Moliné, go to uh, liberatervacom and uh, check out what Cal is doing. And um, we're, we're running out of time. We, we should have done this earlier. But next week, we are going to try to see if we can get our old friend Nick to come and visit us. So we will see you next week. Niz, do you have any uh, parting uh, goodbyes? Disassociationnation.com. Check it out. Check it out. Peace. 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 Next week. Same time. See you guys Same at the time. party. Same yeah, so we're, we're, we're going to have you back on again, Cal. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. This That's is great. Cool. Thank you guys for inviting me in. Oh, no problem. Glad to have you here. Yeah.